holistic and interconnected holistic and interconnected approach to student success. Um, excited again to be here. Um, I am always uh, interested in questions and dialogue along the way. So feel free to, um, if something pops up, you don't have to wait to the end. All right. So what we hope to accomplish today um, is I want to talk about sort of this shift that's been happening. Maybe it's a uh, shift your campus is going through. Maybe you're ahead of the curve. Um, but to talk about the shift to a holistic well-being model and an approach to student health, um, outline some core constructs of well-being um, as it pertains to specific measurement and how to measure well-being on your campus, um, and then some of the key findings that have come from this three to four year project that, um, again, I've been a part of with a group of others across the country, um, as well as we had some Canadian folks, so an international project as well. Before we do that, um, and I feel like there's always these little parts of presentations, um, just expectation setting, making sure that we're all on the same page talking about like, why does this matter? Um, where did this work come from? Um, so first, identifying sort of the impetus for this type of work uh, and the focus that we all have as professionals. This may obviously is maybe slides we show to our colleagues um, as we're talking about the efforts we're doing on our campus. Um, but I'm always struck by this particular report that I'm showing here on the screen, or these are snippets from a report. Um, it's it's from a chief student affairs uh, so NASPA did a chief student affairs officer or like dean of students level, like the head of your student affairs student life divisions and ask them like, what are the pressing things that you are um, curious about? What are the things that, you know, quote unquote, keep you up at night or what are the challenges you're facing? Uh, and also the opportunities that you feel is your duty and responsibility at that high sort of level of chief student affairs officer. Um, and what always kind of stands out to me is like the what we have here, I'm going to start on the right hand side, the top three administrative issues on campus are diminishing resources, whether that be state, um, local funding, um, just the natural uh, slide, unfortunately, that we've been seeing in higher ed over the course of time. Um, the compliance and regulatory requirements, strategic planning, managing crises on campus, and the construction of new facilities. In terms of the top three student learning and success issues on campus, there's graduation completion rates, persistence. Um, so, you know, butts in seats equal dollars. So tied to that funding issue, but how do we um, make sure not only students are here, but they're thriving and getting the best out of their experience. Um, Donna, yes, we will get a copy of these slides for sure. I'm just seeing that pop here in the chat. Uh, so no need to vigorously write anything down, um, but take, some of those takeaways and you'll have the slides for yourself. Uh, and then the, back to the learning and success issues is curricular and co-curricular learning experiences where I think a lot of us live as those in the student life, student affairs divisions to support the academic environment. Um, but we also know that students are spending just as much or more time outside of the classroom as they are in. So making sure we're creating an, a robust learning environment for them. More specifically for a lot of us on the call, um, health and wellness was a main topic um, that sort of nestles underneath these administrative and learning outcomes that they are focused on. Um, and what we've seen from this in terms of what are people focused on, what do Chief Student Affairs think of, mental health um, rises to the top, uh, but then you can see by second and third, uh, this is alcohol use and illicit drug use. So a lot of the AOD work and great work that happens here at IHEC. Um, and you can see how all these are interconnected, right? So mental health might have connection to substance use or vice versa. Um, and then for the rest of them, we have suicide prevention, sexual assault, prescription drug use or misuse, uh, violence and firearms. So we know that health and wellness is a pertinent and salient topic um, as students are with us for however long they are. Additionally, we're seeing um, there's been this narrative, I feel like, since I started out. So I didn't give you too much about my background, so I'll do that now. So apologies, but um, I am a lecturer at uh, MSU Denver, which is a local university here in the area where I teach in our um, health professions department, um, allowing 
uh, students the opportunity to uh, take a series of three classes that allow them to sit and become board certified health and wellness coaches. Uh, so coaching and health and wellness has been the core focus of my entire career. Um, I got started out in the Midwest, though, working in a student wellness center doing health promotion based work. Um, and I feel like for those since 10 years, a little over 10 years since I've started, there's been this like narrative around a uh, mental health crisis or like a well-being crisis on our college campuses. And we're seeing some of that backed up by data, but there's also this narrative around how are we supporting our students, faculty and staff to the fullest. Um, so these are some, these are some uh, data points that are taken from a variety of different sources. So that first one that I just shared was from the Chief Student Affairs Officers Report um, that was done uh, about a, it's a little, getting a little bit older now. They haven't done as many recently, um, but these are from like the American College Health Association, the National College Health Assessment, Healthy Minds, et cetera. Um, but what we've seen as trends nationally is that there's been a five times increase in counseling center utilization. And I think partly that's a good thing. We're doing a lot of good work to reduce stigma that people can seek out help and support for a variety of issues. But at the same time, we are also having students maybe who've come in with previously diagnosed mental health uh, issues or concerns or a variety of other things, but that utilization is going up and our college counseling centers are being flooded. Um, we're also seeing that about 50% of students are reporting that they're feeling lonely. 30% are endorsing one type of non-suicidal self-injury. And then in terms of counseling visits themselves, whether that be for mental health, alcohol and other drug or some other issues, um, the average session length is, or like duration length is about five, just over five sessions themselves. Um, and then from a positive note, or to look at some positive constructs, there's um, some work that the National College Health Assessment has instituted to put in measures of flourishing or thriving. And uh, just over 30% of our student population is meeting the criteria for thriving, um, which is higher than I would have originally thought uh, based off of working on campus, but still pretty low. Um, and for me, it's I, my degree is in higher education and student affairs. We talk about the mission statements of a lot of our universities or of our student affairs divisions. And it's all about, you know, creating um, and creating an environment for the whole person to develop and to be them their best selves. Um, and 30% uh, are meeting criteria for maybe that lofty mission and vision that we have as universities and student affairs divisions. So it's something that I really um, you know, hope we can get on top of. And some of this research that we'll talk about will will support that and the work that you're doing as well. Uh, Christine, curious if you have read The Anxious Generation. Yes, lots of data on Gen Z and the health outcomes. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, Jonathan Haidt is uh, very big in this space, a uh, thought leader in this space, uh, talking about the trends specifically um, related to that. Um, uh, that ha that does sort of inform a lot of the work that I think um, I've been interested in. Um, if there's anything in particular you want to call up there, but that is a good resource for others if you want to kind of dig in a little bit more. Thanks for bringing that up, Christine. So the these data points I just put in there quickly to talk about in level set the reason and rationale. Um, so at the time, I was working at the University of Denver here, uh, which is a private private liberal arts college, um, that they approached some people uh, and said, like, we really want to study um, and talk about like what makes uh, well-being efforts work, what makes health promotion efforts really work on campus. So again, this is a partnership from the American College Health Foundation and Aetna Student Health to answer a couple of core key questions. And there's a series of studies we did over the uh, couple of years that I'm going to highlight sort of high level. What did we do? What did we find? Um, and what does this potentially mean for you all in your own respective roles? So that will be the uh, sort of flow from the session now on. So the first study um, was framing well-being. What does this even mean? There's this growing movement, this growing body of literature. There's all these programs, all these services that are happening across the country. Um, but let's maybe try to see if we can come up with um, some baseline understanding of how we're talking about this work. And there's good work that has happened not only 
here um, for the American College Health Association, but like NURSA, um, there's actually a multi-associational definition of well-being that has sort of emerged and some good research that's coming out of that as well. We think of like a Kuhuai, like all the housing folks. We have NURSA, the recreation and, and um, fitness folks. You have NASPA, ACPA, uh, uh, ACHA, all these associations coming together to talk about this issue. Um, and this is sort of one project that I think kind of is happening or dovetailing nicely with the efforts that are happening there. But the first is framing college uh, well-being on a college campus. What does that actually mean? What does that actually look like? So as an overview of um, the initiatives, uh, what happened is there were the, or one of the goals of this project was to develop an overview of the range of well-being initiatives uh, that are currently being offered at a variety of sample colleges and universities. There's also the desire from this project to highlight innovation, places that are doing it well, uh, ways that we can all learn and develop and also implement in our own unique ways since our campuses are um, similar, but also unique with their own culture, with their own po student populations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then the impetus or the outcome of this was to create a white paper, um, which we have, and I can share those links to make sure those are sent out if you wanna dig in and read more. Um, but the white paper was sort of the way to culminate all of our findings from this research study. So again, this is a partnership between Aetna uh, Student Health and the American College Health Foundation, which is sort of an offshoot of ACHA, um, the American College Health Association, uh, one of the major players in this space. Um, I'm just going to move on because that's just more of uh, the partnership. But for study one, um, the what happened, and I'll get into some of the methodology of what the group did, um, but there were a few key terms that um, as a group, they just sort of used to make sure that there was, again, baseline expectation of like, to so make sure we're talking about the same thing. We definitely want to hear what it looks like on your campus. But overall, here are some like base definitions we're at least going to start as a like working base. Um, and the first was well-being. Um, and drew upon the literature there to say that well-being at minimum is the presence of positive emotions and moods such as contentment and happiness, the absence of negative emotions like depression and anxiety, it's uh, satisfaction with life, fulfillment, and positive functioning. We took this from the CDC. Uh, there was also this idea of well-being initiatives because we were looking at well-being initiatives at a variety of different campuses and saw that as a collection of programs, practices, and policies that were designed to enhance individual and community well-being, um, not a singular discrete program. Um, for instance, when I got my start, I was running a wellness coaching program. We were not looking at one program specific. It was how does this wellness coaching program partner with our basics and K6, with our peer education program, uh, with our well-being collective efforts and packaging those all together into an initiative um, and how do those initiatives come together to support the entire ecosystem at our at a respective campus. So well-being initiative is those collections of programs, policies, and practices. There's also a focus in this research on health equity and health disparity. So Drew, uh, from those definitions about everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible for health equity, and disparity is the differences in health outcomes and their causes among groups of people. And many health disparities are related to the social determinants of health. So drew from the public health literature there. What do we actually do though, um, in terms of the methodology? Um, so 10 institutions um, participated in this research via purposeful selection. So we were reaching out based off of the respective networks of who is doing innovative collective impact type work. Um, but 10 institutions were selected uh, for this initial study that happened a few years ago. Um, they uh, included a spectrum of institutions. We did chunk the, or sort of categorize the institutions we worked off into three different types. Um, the three different types were ones that had well-being initiatives that either served students primarily. So that was one group. We had a cohort that was uh, well-being initiatives that supported faculty and staff uh, mostly. So think more like HR departments. And then there was one that did sort of a hybrid approach or did both. Like they were in charge of doing faculty and staff 
and student all in one. Um, sort of those initiatives were all in one into sort of integrated compared to separate type initiatives. So those are the three types of institutions um, that took place there to do this work, um, really in-depth uh, interviews. Um, so we had interviews on campuses uh, with like directors of health promotion and just leaders in the space. Um, again, if it was a faculty uh, staff organization, you're thinking of the human resources, benefits and administration, uh, as well as just university administration in general. Uh, participants were overall enthusiastic about the project and sharing information on their respective uh, initiatives to inform this white paper. Um, and the research team itself included a variety of people such as myself. Some were, again, subject matter experts in faculty staff well-being, some were in student well-being, some were in both, um, and some were just like really subject matter experts in, uh, as I'll show here in, in the later portions of the, the project, those who are really subject matter experts in like quantitative data research, taking a look at that um, statistics um, and just the field of well-being as a whole in terms of what the research was looking like. In terms of the schools themselves, um, there were again were virtual interviews. Um, we did also focus groups where we were able to talk to um, faculty, staff, and students as well. So not just the leaders of initiatives to get their opinions, but the end users, if you will, the people who are receiving the well-being initiatives on their um, respective campus. And each interview had uh, two people from our research team. So one was facilitating and one was doing sort of the note taking, um, which was a, a, a key part to make sure that we were capturing everything that we needed. In terms of like, what do those 10 schools look like? Um, the schools did represent a sort of diverse cross section of, uh, um, uh, of US demographics, uh, national de uh, demographics, because we are international, so because we did some, um, some schools elsewhere. Um, but we had uh, also like different research uh, or different university types, excuse me. We had large state universities, both the US and Canada were represented. We had an HBCU. Um, we did a large state system, which included community colleges, um, large, private, and public. Um, we had small, private. We did urban, suburban, rural, um, and then also geographically, northeast, southwest, and midwest were primarily where these schools were clustered. And the student populations vary for anywhere from 2,500 to 300,000. Um, and universities that were also focused on undergraduate, graduate, and research type universities. So we try to hit on as many of those boxes as we could um, when we first started with these 10 schools. The research questions that we primarily were focused on were these here on the board. Um, these guided those interviews. So first and foremost, we are asking, here's the definition of what, excuse me, we mean by well-being, but how does your campus define well-being? Um, what initiatives do you have on your campus that promote student well-being, but also faculty and staff well-being, depending on the group and cohort they were in? How were those initiatives developed? Can you uh, describe problems or obstacles, both institutional and individual, that might get in the way? Um, how does your department work with others uh, in your institution to improve well-being, some of this collective impact type effort? How would you describe the relationship between student equity and well-being, and how do you measure well-being? So those are the main guiding questions that we brought into these uh, research interviews, um, and it's really fascinating. I didn't take part in the interviewing itself, but I had the um, not only the transcriptions but also the um, the recordings to all of them. So I did listen to all of them one summer when it was a little bit quieter. Um, to to really dig in and what was interesting is to be a part of the team that then worked on the white paper to come up with the key takeaways so this white paper is the first uh, in this series um, i'll make sure not only with these slides but to make sure the hyperlinks to this uh, paper if you want to dig in and read the whole thing um, but the framing well-being on a college campus setting um, came out and we were able to come up with these main takeaways um, the first of which is maybe not surprising, but also maybe a little frustrating, even though we came in with a common definition just to have a baseline. What we found is that every institution and every school was thinking about this a little bit differently. While there were commonalities um, for 
all of them. There was no like, we are using uh, the CDC definition or we are using the inter-association uh, of higher ed sort of well-being definition. We were kind of using mostly our own. Um, the similarities that I will say to all of them is that um, there was this transition from sort of, or transitioning, I would say, from wellness to well-being. Uh, a lot of that was around um, wellness maybe being more associated specifically with fitness um, or physical health. And that is an important part of health and wellness, but it is only one aspect. So there's this recognition that well-being maybe was a little bit more expansive, was a little bit more holistic. And it also spoke to a commonality where a lot of these initiatives were saying that well-being is also interconnected. Um, so if I have uh, mental health challenges, that might impact my relationship with substances or um, my relationship with substances might impact my relationships with people, my social well-being, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these are not standalone things, but they are interconnected in holistic processes. And wellness to well-being was maybe more of a reflection of that um, because there's so much associated with like physical health with the word wellness itself. Um, so as a sort of shift is what we were seeing as a theme throughout. Um, we are also seeing that there was a move towards a, a systems approach to well-being. So while we will always have um, health education and health education strategies or programs, it's important to see those programs work together and even more so and more importantly to think about um, integrating practices and policies at a system level that help us move beyond the walls of a campus and into our local communities. So taking more of the systemic approach to the way that we're supporting health and wellness. Uh, one common example that I know that I was a part of um, at one of my institutions when I first started was working on a, a first year forgiveness program. Uh, it was a mental health policy that we're instituting across the academy that, uh, you know, often that transition from wherever you are into your first year. Uh, at this time, I was at a large land grant four year university. Um, there were uh, a lot of students who would get into these large classes and would not do well. Um, and that, tra that academic transition was hard. So there was a policy that we were instituting that in your first year, if you're sort of having these like shakeups and, you know, like the Chem 101s or whatever, which a lot of people did at the school I was at, um, you were able to retake that class. Um, and then uh, if your grade was better, uh, put that grade and sort of supplant the one that you had originally, uh, but it had to be only within that first year. So it was this idea of like, how do you support transition um, for students as they make the academic transition for them specifically? So look, looking at policies like that uh, for uh, you all to uh, support well being for your students. Ah, thank you. Yes, Kayla uh, linked there in the chat the link to the first paper, or at least the, I didn't click on it, but I think the first. Uh, landing page for it, but thank you. Uh, so first two, no comments that definition, but there's some similarities we talked about. Also the systems approach. Uh, and then the harder part that we were seeing was like, how do you measure well-being? We have a lot of data um, in a lot of other spaces, but because it's maybe nebulous, maybe because it's new, it's also very expansive and there's no one set definition. How do you effectively measure um, well-being was a common theme that was sort of some people were doing it, some people had harder times, some people were pulling in other data. So there's this like takeaway for us as a project team that that was maybe the next frontier of how to expand this work is to start looking at how we frame and define, but then how do we measure well-being? And that's where study two came in. Um, and this one, I was more intimately involved from the beginning, uh, drawing upon my background um, in health education, but also just really being a nerd for the research behind uh, well-being, not only in higher education, but elsewhere. But in this study too, the project goals were to test um, processes, procedures for institutional-wide survey administration with faculty, staff, and students on campus. So we were going to create our own uh, assessment uh, for well-being based off of what we saw as best practice, what we were also seeing in the literature, and seeing its applications to not only students, but faculty and staff as well. So the entire population to get more at this campus-wide approach. Um, 
We are hoping to develop baseline cross population data for participating campuses and in aggregate, um, specifically on this emotional well being tool that we are creating. And then to run statistical validation tests on how that, uh, how our responses were correlating to other um, outcomes and other things that we were interested in. So we wanted to look at that and also validate the tool itself. So similarly, we, we went into the research. Uh, we started big. Our, in study one, we used the CDC definition um, to talk about what, um, what well-being was. But myself and a couple others were primarily focused on, in this first step, to create this survey tool. We reviewed the literature. Um, we reviewed literature that we had found for the previous paper, but also wanted to expand upon that and look into um, the measurement specifically of well-being. Um, so that was sort of the first and second step was looking into that research and then sort of coming up with our own working definition and our own working model um, of what uh, well-being and emotional well-being specifically looked like uh, for this population. And that's what we're seeing here on our screen. So by scouring the research, by looking through, um, we saw a lot of similarities and a lot of work obviously has been done. We wanted to think about that and layer that on top of um, the work that's happening specifically within higher education. So the sort of third step after reviewing the literature and coming up with the definition was to create our own conceptual model for well-being to guide our survey development. And what we did at a, at a high level, and this is what you're seeing here, and this is a snapshot from the second paper. Um, no pressure, Kayla, if you can find the second paper and you want to drop that in there as well, that'd be uh, super appreciated. Um, but emotional well-being, we, we saw as being having sort of four main core constructs. There was a sense of community and belonging. There's a lot of research um, in well-being, but also in higher ed specifically, is that like community and a sense of belonging are critical factors for feeling sense of uh, um, uh, health, vitality, um, and well-being overall. So we saw that as a core construct that we want to make sure to include. There's also this a lot of work specifically. Uh, thank you for dropping that in the chat. Uh, the second paper is there if you want to take a look. Uh, but a lot of work has been done and maybe orig originally had been done on like individual behaviors. Uh, what are coping and stress management techniques? Your ability to be resilient um, for yourself. Um, and to combat the life stressors that you have. So there is a construct there of like individually, how can you cope? What are stress management uh, techniques? We also saw similar to community and belonging, the, the idea of meaning and purpose um, has a whole body of research and a, a large body of research, particularly around a life well lived and well being. Um, and then there's like these overarching theories around subjective well being. So we wanted to include those. Um, so those are the four main constructs. And then because we're also seeing this shift towards a systemic uh, approach, policy-driven approach, um, we wanted to include campus environments or environment or factors questions to the survey itself. Um, so those are, again, some specific things uh, that we're seeing done more organizational-wide, organizational health, we choose from some of that research as well. So that was our original um, sort of conceptual model. We then dug in and reviewed existing surveys, scales and items, like individual questions from the different surveys from this body of research um, to start throwing together what we wanted to do as a, uh, a new survey for higher ed specifically. Um, what I have here on the screen is just a little bit more breakdown of like how we really dug in from those original core concepts to get into smaller sort of sub contexts here. Um, so you can see community belonging um, is broken into like social connectedness, confidence, safety, and trust, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All the way down, you can kind of see how we broke this down uh, more so. And then that link in the uh, chat gives you, if you want to go to the actual paper, has even more there. But as I mentioned, we, after having that conceptual model, we needed to dig in and find questions that specifically aligned with the goals of creating a new emotional well being survey. Uh, so, using these sort of four plus one, so five core concepts, you can see some of the, um, you can see some of the uh, scales, validated scales that we took from. So, that's another part that was like, we're not just going to go anywhere. We wanted to see and use validated tools that were already being um, 
used for this type of work and apply it to this setting. So for community and belonging, um, there's the well-being process, Dean or flourishing scale via character strengths, mental health continuum short form at uh, Corey Keys. Um, and then Wake Forest has a specific well-being assessment that they, they, they institute. And we had someone from their team uh, helping us. And so we use some of their questions as well. And you can see throughout each of the other constructs kind of where we took them from. To give you an example and to dig in more, um, here's just one example of we took something from the Diener Satisfaction with Life Scale. Um, this was for the subjective well-being uh, latent construct. Uh, and then the subconstruct was for life satisfaction and, and happiness. So if we go back to the here, it kind of breaks it down. And so we had this sort of chart and process as a team that we were looking at to look at it. The notes here, we have no changes. For some questions, we did change the question uh, a little bit just to be like, in a college setting, like to put it in that context was primarily any changes that we made to these questions. Uh, but you could see like, um, we had a huge spreadsheet of all these sort of listed out before we decided on the main ones. Um, but this is just an example of what that would look like. So from the Diener satisfaction, we actually used the scale itself because there's only a few questions. Um, and these are ones that we immediately popped into our survey itself. Um, again, another example here, I'm just going to move forward. This is from the Wake uh, Forest Wellbeing Assessment. But in terms of the methodology for this, once we looked at the literature, got the definition, came up with our uh, sort of conceptual model, um, looked at existing surveys, we then created our own pilot survey using those existing scales and wanted to conduct a pilot administration of that survey to validate the instrument itself. So um, the first iteration of this, we had six institutions that self-selected into the study. Um, there are three Midwest, one New England, one Mid-Atlantic, and one Southwest. All six schools surveyed faculty, staff, and students on at least one of their campuses. Um, so might have, there was a couple that were a multi-campus uh, system. We had nearly 7,000 respondents, which was over 1,100 per school on average. Um, and then it's important to note here, yeah, some schools surveyed had multiple campuses, i.e. law, health uh, sciences with their own sort of unique population. So it's cool to do some uh, analysis there um, on what that looked like. Um, one thing to note is that this what we started to do this work um, and then all of a sudden COVID happened. Um, so we were doing this right in the middle of that. Um, and so that uh, I think decreased our chances to um, get as many people as we wanted to here at the beginning, which is why we did another re-administration of it later. Um, but obviously at that time, we were all trying to figure out and make sure that our campuses were safe and healthy, um, and there's a lot going on. Um, some takeaways though from this first administration of that emotional well-being survey. Um, overall, faculty scored higher and i.e. healthier as a group across multiple scales and measures of mental health and emotional well-being as compared to their staff and student peers. Uh, students tended to score lower with respect to overall mental health and emotional well-being as compared to their peers. Um, and then again, given the response participating in the study during COVID-19, the research team also investigated the potential impacts. Um, we did add a question um, here at this stage, kind of at the last later stages to make sure that we could capture this. Um, the impacts of remote work and learning modalities on participants' mental health and emotional well-being. Uh, interestingly, in this first administration, no significant differences were found pertaining to modality, i.e. if you were a remote student, your well-being levels were not higher or lower than if you were someone who was primarily on campus or doing a hybrid um, situation. Um, as hypothesized, the findings of the current study demonstrate um, and I'll get into this in a lot more detail when I get into sort of the third iteration where we dug in specifically on the psychometrics and the validation of the tool, uh, but some of the perceptions of environmental factors on campus, i.e. institutional values and mental health, et cetera, et cetera, showed meaningful results in initial regression analyses. So the third study, after we're like, okay, what is well-being? What does it look like? How's it framed? How's it being talked about on campuses? Because it's a trend we're seeing. 
noticing that measurement was maybe a little bit tougher and trying to maybe take a couple steps in that direction and help out creating our own survey instrument and then running it for its initial uh, pilot uh, administration. The third one really looked to analyze the tool itself um, and to dig in more into the data to see what trends we were seeing. And we also were able to get uh, three more schools um, to jump on in um, and a second administration of the tool. Again, this was during the, the COVID pandemic. Um, so it was a little bit harder to get schools. So we did it again. Um, I think it was roughly like eight months later. Um, and we were able to, again, add three more schools and bump up our uh, participation rates. We also wanted to look at the data with a particular lens on health disparities and health equity, because those were some of our initial research questions. Um, so adding that layer was the sort of third part of this series. Uh, some things to what I'm going to now put up on the screen is just kind of share some of the actual data. This is um, things that you can find in the uh, third installment of this paper. Um, so at this point, again, to give you some numbers and context, after doing the second administration, we had almost 8,000, uh, up to 8,000 students, faculty, and staff from nine participating institutions of higher ed um, to complete the American College Health Foundation Emotional Wellbeing Survey. That's kind of the working title that it had. The survey was administered um, to six volunteer institutions, spring 2021, and then three additional institutions in the fall. So I guess it was like six-ish months. Um, we, uh, just for those who are interested in sort of the statistical side of things, missing and outlier data were examined, uh, followed by descriptive item analysis. Um, scales were then specifically examined in relation to students, faculty, um, staff, as well as sex and race and ethnicity. So looking at how um, those different populations uh, broke down also by their demographic information to look with this health disparity um, and just by subgroup lens. What you're seeing here on the screen um, is sort of the faculty, staff, and students by gender, race, and ethnicity. So you can see that there um, in terms of what people were doing. Uh, thank you, Kayla. I think finding the, yep, the third one, third paper that's there in the chat. And then um, more specifically, not just like who took it, but looking at the scales themselves. Um, so the survey, again, ex sought to examine well-being through measuring uh, four main constructs, that community and belonging or social connectedness, coping and stress management, purpose and meaning, and subjective well-being. Uh, we added those environmental and college campus environment questions uh, as well. Each of these latent constructs was measured through um, three scales for a total of 12 scales across four constructs. Um, more of that can be uh, found and detailed specifically um, in the... Um, specifically in the paper. Uh, and what we also were doing is because these scales that we're using had different scoring metrics. Some were like out of 100, some were out of maybe 50, some were, you know, just depending on the questions themselves. Um, and this is outside of my necessarily purview. Um, but there we had someone who is the statistical wizard um, who was able to sort of standardize the scales all across into a 100 point scale. So we were talking apples to apples, not apples to oranges. Um, so the findings across these 12 scales and four constructs show variation between students, staff, and faculty. Um, specifically, students report less community and belonging, less coping, more stress, lower purpose and meaning, and more depression and isolation. Um, in each instance, these differences were statistically significant. Um, so you're seeing some of those four, the four main constructs here across those students, faculty, and staff. Uh, Katie, I'm uh, not seeing Native American. Were they popped into other? It's, I think you're referencing the slide behind. I would, I, I'm thinking yes is the answer to your question. I don't remember fully. Um, thanks for calling that to my attention. I'm not exactly remembering exactly. We, what we did is we used the same, um, I believe we use the same sort of um, demographic questions or demographic like profile questions and sub responses as was currently being used by some other things by ACHA. So 
I don't remember that off the top of my head, but I believe that's how it broke down. And we wanted to do that uh, for consistency, but we also know that with doing these types of things, there's always going to be a quote unquote other group. And we know that there's some problems with doing that. So I, I recognize the, the, the problem there, um, but we were doing it for consistency sake, if my memory is serving me correct of like what they have been using in other surveys across other things that they have done. Uh, table C, which is from this third paper, looks at satisfaction with life, uh, which is one of those subjective well-being uh, by students, faculty, and staff, as well as by sex and race and ethnicity. A key finding here is that students report um, significantly lower satisfaction with life as compared to their staff and faculty peers with an average score of si about 61 out of 100. Um, as a trend, female respondents in this study reported higher, sex, higher satisfaction with life scores than their male counterparts or male identifying counterparts. Um, with respect to race and ethnicity, Black and African American respondents showed lower scores, particularly for students uh, and staff, though not among faculty. And finally, the mean scores appear to be driven um, by the large number of white participants or respondents in the study themselves. Once um, and that's my stats language coming through um, as I'm uh, remembering our calls um, and thinking back to when they dug into the results um, specifically. So we looked at those four constructs, but then you also, we added again that sort of fifth construct, which is this institutional campus environment type question, these system level type questions. Um, and so those were sort of chunked into perceptions of the institutional support for mental health, perceptions of institutional value for just people in general, perceptions of institutional support for diversity, and perceptions of trust in the institution as a whole. Um, you can see that those are broken up by students, staff, and faculty. Um, scores are relatively low across all groups with the perception of institutional support for diversity coming in the lowest um, at 38, about 39%, 30%, and 31% for students, staff, and faculty respectively. Faculty perceptions of institutional support are lower, lower as a general trend across all four variables than their student and faculty peers. Table E um, from that third paper, which I'm showing here on the screen, um, try to look and control for other variables such as rate and ethnicity. Uh, while there are differences in depression, satisfaction with life, and perception of institutional support for mental health, um, individuals uh, and diversity as well as trust in the institution, there was no statistically significant differences in sex found across the groups when controlling for other variables. There are limited statistically significant differences when controlling for other variables in the model related to race ethnicity and the two measures of well being. Um, a key finding is that perception of the institution, though, that sort of fifth bucket, were the strongest predictors of emotional well being when controlling for other variables. So when you control things uh, all else considered or all things the same, those, those questions we had in that sort of fifth bucket the perceptions of institutional support, the campus environment questions, those have the highest correlations with well-being than all the others. So this was a key finding of why the title of this paper is the influence of environmental factors for um, well-being. Uh, so it's really, really interesting to look at that. Um, and specifically of those four sort of stub in the institutional questions, um, the perception of support for diversity is the strongest predictor when looking at standardized beta of emotional well-being. So if the institution had a higher support for diversity efforts, it had higher correlations to um, higher senses of well-being across faculty, staff, and student populations. And for me, as someone who, um, again, grew up um, interested in this and then was trained uh, in a grad program that focused on this, it was something that I felt like we did, and maybe you'll experience this too on your campus, so they're, they're often different. Um, you have, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging offices, you have well-being, health promotion offices, but rarely are they combined. And for me, it's like, they are one and the same. You can't have 
a thriving environment that is not inclusive and equitable. And you cannot have um, equity without creating the conditions where everyone can become their best self. And so there are really two efforts that I think are coming together or I hope will continue to come together. That was a big insight for me as I thought about how I made strategic partnerships across the university for my health promotion efforts. Um, I know from like a AOD perspective, um, one uh, study that I know that does some really great work around this is um, the color of drinking study um, that's being done. Um, just like thinking about that from a, a holistic and an interconnected lens as well. But that was a really key insight for us as a group is that those institutional variables were of highest correlation and specifically the diversity question was the highest of those four. So main takeaways again here, just to summarize, students have lower emotional well-being as compared to their faculty and staff peers. Uh, the perception of the environment is a critically important factor in predicting emotional well-being in both the absence of disease, uh, things like depression, but also the presence of thriving, aka satisfaction with life. And again, we were studying both of those um, with perception of institutional support for diversity being the most important among all variables considered. So I kind of put this here is like this idea that they are interconnected. Um, the line's not showing up here, but it's a classic Venn diagram type um, model here and trying to focus specifically on intersections of this work because they are mutually supportive of one another. Um, one example that I've seen from Compton College that I thought was really great, that's in, indicative of an environmental approach in an environmental policy um, that supports both of these efforts in terms of equity and access and inclusivity, but also in terms of well-being. Um, and this is, I saw this on LinkedIn, um, but the President of Compton College, I think this was, oh yeah, so about, what's that, math, eight months ago, six months, six, 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 eight months ago. Um, but it says here, today during my employee office hours, one of our classified professionals talked about how students are struggling to purchase blue books and scantrons for exams. After that meeting, I wonder why college universities charge students for blue books and scantrons. Not anymore at Campton College, effective on October 2nd, 2023, those items will be free. Now we will be providing the following to students, free parking, free metro passes, free printing, free blue books, one free meal per day on the campus, um, every table cafeteria. Uh, we will continue to remove barriers that hinder student success. I love Compton College. So I think it's a really amazing example of ways that we can come together to make the most impact for our communities um, and to make it as equitable um, and have uh, thriving be at the center of all of it is being able to introduce policies or to introduce ways of working and ways of being that allows and removes barriers for people to become their best selves, which is the goal of higher education specifically. There is one more uh, paper. This one I was uh, part of a little less so. So I would say I sort of started and then ramped up and then for study four, um, was more on the technical side of things. Um, so if you are interested on sort of the psychometrics of the tool itself, um, there is a paper there um, that you can take a look at um, to understand how the assessment is sort of is and will continue to evolve as more and more iterations and administrations of it happen. Um, but this report described the development of the conceptual defin definition of emotional well-being again, that guided this new instrument uh, outlines the process of those latent concepts associated with the selected definitions and various scales and measures. Um, but more so, and what makes this differentiated, the fourth one is that it includes a detailed description of the testing, validation, and implementation of the survey and the approach to the psychometric analysis. And you could take a look at those there. Um, I know that they keep being dropped here in the chat from Kayla, much appreciated. They all do live on one website in one spot. Uh, to kind of highlight this well-being initiative process overall. Um, so I can make sure to include those for uh, anyone who is interested. But what I wanted to do now with the remaining time is just to see if there's any sort of discussion or questions um, that you may have as you think about this work, this evolving work, and what it might mean for you, uh, specifically um, in the world of primary prevention and AOD type work. Kayla, thank you for being my 
moderator today. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, landing page for all the reports is listed there in the chat. Katie, did the universities who participated in the study have to pay? No, they did not. Um, especially at the beginning, um, we were just trying to advance the field uh, and to do this work. And we were able to give um, not only these high level reports back, but like individually, what did your campus, um, what does uh, your campus population look like? So that was sort of the um, thanks for being a part of it. And we wanna make sure that there's value being given back. And I believe on that landing page, there's also maybe information on sort of current, uh, where they currently are at with that. So if there are, is interest um, to kind of take a look at those things as well. Thank you, Katie. Also, Katie, I'm gonna answer this and since I don't see any others popping in. Are you in a position to do a research case study on a specific university system? Are you meaning me individually? For me, I would not be able to uh, personally, um, but I do know that there's the fine folks there at ACHA, ACHF. Um, if there are particular questions that you have or curiosities around your university or around your system, I would encourage you to reach out there. Great, thank you. Anything else? Oops. Sorry, my screen popped away. I was trying to make sure I had the chat re pulled back up. I'm not seeing anything else on my end. Yeah, me either. I am going to stop share then so that I can see our lovely boxes here um, and just say thank you um, for letting me share sort of this multi year exploration of what well-being looks like on our campuses, what it means for our work. Um, I hope that you all find something at least like that you can bring to a meeting or to a conversation. Um, but really, it, it does take us all to do this. And that's the, the key part that I've learned. Um, it takes organizations like this and collections of people like this to have these types of conversations as we remove access, remove barriers, sorry, remove barriers and increase access and the opportunity to well-being for all of our populations, our faculty, staff, and our students. Um, so thank you all for letting me be here today. Yeah, thank you for your time today and sharing the information that you've got. It's like for CHES certifications and, and like LCSW, LCCs for uh, that, I will be handling that. So you will have to fill out an evaluation form that I will be sending out to emails. So when you register for the Zoom, I will be sending it that way. Uh, and then just make sure you get those in promptly so I can submit those to NCHEC. Uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to send me a direct email. And that is alescamilla at eiu.edu. Thank you all. All right. Thank you all for your time today. Bye.